Hello, hello, hello. We're continuing with our review of Better Call Saul uh, Season 6 and we're on episode 8, Point and Shoot. It's been six weeks since the last one. Six weeks since the cliffhanger uh, of Lalo turning up. And spoilers, yeah there will be spoilers because we have discussions of plot points to come. Um, so click away. I have to do that because people, you know, they get upset. I don't want to spoil it, but we want to talk about the story, don't we? We want to throw out some predictions, and to do that, we need to talk about, you know, what's going on. But yeah, uh, point and shoot is references there. Normally, point and shoot's a camera, but in this, it's referring to a gun. Uh, the open, the cold open of the show sees. Well, as soon as I saw that expensive shoe bobbing in the ocean, it was obvious it was Howard's shoe, and the the camera pans back and it looks like he's done a Reggie Perrin um, look that one up uh, and his car's dumped to the beachside and again once that's there I said I was, said, I was watching it with the missus and I said well that's Mike because <laughs> it was too sophisticated for uh, Kim and um, Jimmy to pull off so once I had that in my mind the rest of the story kind of unfolding kind of un it, it, it unfolded how I expected it to um, well, in a way, certain plot points happened as I expected, um, which was, you know, it was all right, but, you know, a little bit predictable, you know, but there you go. But it wasn't necessarily about that. So, yeah, we go back to the apartment, and Lalo's laying, you know, he's, he's, he's laying out what he wants from them. He's, he wants them to assassinate Gus, but they don't know that. They don't know exactly who they're being sent to. But, of course... Um, Lalo is actually one step ahead because he actually wants to use this to you know, pull men away from the meth lab that they're building and get in. That was all he weighs his, ha his aim because he wanted to you know, show Don Deladio, Del let's get his name mangled, uh, they wanted to show, he wants to show him what Gus was really up to and get him out of the, out of the syndicate, out of the cartel business and, you know, well, murdered, killed, taken out. That was always his end game. Don't you remember? Um, so, yeah, I mean, again, it was always going to be an interesting strategy because Mike knows, well, both Kim and Jimmy, so all eyes on that house would have, got, would have been alerted to something being up if they had turned up there, if either of them had turned up there, but again... Jimmy sends Kim in the hope that he can save her, and that if she does run, it will just be him that you know that gets finished. But that was never Lalo's concern. Once they were out, he was off to the meth lab. Um, so you know, leaving Jimmy hogtied to the chair, staring into the dead face of Howard Hamlin. Poor Howard. Poor Howard. But more about poor Howard later on. Um, so yeah, we end with the with the the big showdown and it's the first time again we've seen it ratcheting up that it, Gus being vulnerable because in Breaking Bad he's pretty much invulnerable he's Superman and you and you wonder how he's got to this point and you can see it um, the the finale in the in the in the half finished meth lab again it was which was signposting because he hid the he hid the the revolver in the caterpillar tracks of the of the digger, and again I mentioned that last time uh, that this was going to be Lalo's end. I, I wanted it to blow up. I wanted it to all collapse, and they built it. Uh, you know that wasn't the act, that wasn't the original you know, meth lab. They built another one. That's, that was my. I'd love to see the idea of him being buried in the meth lab. Well, it kind of comes to pass. But anyway, we have this shootout in the dark, and again you can tell that Gus. Again, is Gus a murderer? Is this his first kill? I think this is because normally he has other people. He pays other people to, you know, to kill for him, and he shoots kind of blindly. He's lucky he hits the shot. There's only three rounds in the revolver, but we see, you know, when the lights come back on, we see that he's struck a fatal blow to Lalo in the throat of all places or in the neck area, which means he can't talk. The golden tongue has been disabled, and Lalo dies with a smile on his face because well he would wouldn't he it's all he can do but we see even though um, Gus has been hit 
and the, uh, the bulletproof vest to take most of the impact, we see a new invulnerability yeah, kind of wash over him. You see, I, I do think it's his first kill. And he, you see the Gus we know kind of you know, takes that deep breath and he's like, nervous Gus is gone because his troubles have been dealt with. That, that was the only man he thinks who could take him down. But he also says he's gonna, you know, he's gonna tell um, old man Salamanca, you know, when he buries them all. Because again, it's always his, it's always his plan to take out the Salamancas. Now this is an act, a personal vendetta. But of course, it doesn't quite go that way, does it? It doesn't quite go that way. There's a, it's a we could call it a, I don't know, a stalemate with that. With that, <laughs> we, we know how that ends. Um, and yeah, and we see how Mike and Co deal with the Howard situation. And Howard, Howard's end. Now again, that would make that be great of like twenty years ago because of the film Howard's End. You know? That'd be like a that'd be oh that's clever that. But no one, if I say Howard's End now, no one really. But Howard's End, and it's good because they put in did they they put in some contacts in his eyes to take the shine off, so he really did look like he was dead. Um, he's dumped in a hole in the meth lab with Lalo. So when when Walter and and Jesse are working hard. Lalo and <laughs> and Howard are watching over them, and I think that's the saddest thing. Because and again, you see it with Mike. Mike even says easy when they throw Howard in. You've got to remember he would know Howard Hamlin because Howard would have gone to the courthouse every day, and and Mike would have seen him at the gate. And you never know. Maybe he gave him a Christmas box. You know, maybe he gave him a tip at Christmas. And I think again, he looks down. And I think there is general, you know, genuine, you know, pity for for Howard and being in that hole. And there's a disdain for Jimmy and Kim at, when he's at their apartment. He says, "You, you, you know, this is your lie. You created this lie." When he says Harry's going to make him look like he's killed himself, you know, cocaine. He's going to put cocaine in the car. He said, "This is your lie." And again, we've got to remember, this is something they're going to have to live with. Howard wouldn't be dead if they never created any of that lie. They expected him to bounce back, but life doesn't always go how you think it's going to go. And I think this is the moment. Now, a lot of people you know, go, oh, well, Kim, Kim's in prison, and you know, Jimmy's this. I think this is the defining moment, because you see Jimmy's face when Howard's bundled into the refrigerator to get him out. That's the last vision. That's... That's how they dealt with, you know, somebody who was always on their side, was always trying to help them, even though they didn't appreciate it. That's his last vision. Now, I don't think Kim goes to prison. I think she has a full-on nervous breakdown. I think she ends up in an institution and revising. Or she does completely just go off the rails and gets drunk and does something stupid. Or, you know, there are many scenarios. But I think it fractures both their personalities. I think uh, Jimmy is dead now, and he he retreats fully in a disassociative state into Saul Goodman. Jimmy's dead because if if he ever goes back to being Jimmy, he has to remember and carry the burden of the murder of Howard Hamlin, and so he enters this kind of disassociative state where the new personality takes over completely and almost like wipes the slate clean. And this is why you know he says the things he says and acts a certain way. It's almost like it's a complete separation from the past, and it goes down to that moment, that moment in that apartment. And again, for Kim, even though you know she's she seems tougher, I think this is going to, like I say, it's either going to put her in the in the nut house, or she's just going to go off the rails. And you know who knows? Maybe she turns to drink. Maybe she you know, does something irresponsible in the courtroom and ends up you know, falling foul of the law. I don't know. But it doesn't completely unravel for them because Jimmy still exists, or Saul Goodman still exists, and he's a very different person. He's a very different person, and this is the defining moment, this moment here. Um, so, yeah, it was a... It was a I know last episode was shocking. It was a shocking end, and it was this was even more depressing. And 
you, how can you like these people? How can you like them? Any sympathy? You can't. I can't root for them. I'm feeling about Jimmy the same way I felt about Walter White in Breaking Bad. <laughs> Is that you know? I don't like these characters anymore. Um, there's no. There's no redeeming feature. Now, we need to talk about the Gene. You know, Gene Tachevich, Tachevich, the Cinnabon manager. Now, is this weighing on his mind? The Isotopes um, air freshener. It's been mentioned. Kim defends somebody who's been given a citation for having an over large isotopes air freshener hanging from his wing mirror uh, from his uh, rear view mirror so I'm not I'm not a car owner so 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 I've got to get used to terminology and could it be that it's the taxi driver taxi driver apparently has been recast because the guy who plays him in the flashbacks has been is another show and I guess there's a, a scheduling conflict which is a shame because he's, he's like a lead character and he's been recast so I've got a feeling that that could be the link to Kim you know that taxi driver maybe I don't know could be a bit of a stretch but um, the people in who write this show like to telegraph plot points well ahead of time and the isotopes air freshener hanging from the rearview mirror seem to be telegraphing that this is somebody who has some sort of connection to Kim maybe they've been sent out to look for him maybe Kim is actually a poacher turned gamekeeper maybe she's you know maybe she throws you know Jimmy Saul under the bus, I don't know. Nobody knows, and that's what we've got to watch. But I think I think Jean I'd like to see again, I've always said it's a love it's a love story. I'd like to see them reconcile him and Kim reconciled, but I don't know. I think this may have completely fractured their relationship. You know, it turns them into different people. It's a defining moment. It could be that he turns himself in and does his time. Because he says that, and then this is what he says to to Walter uh, when he's being held in Breaking Bad. He, he he makes some comment about you know sometimes you you know it's better just to serve your time you know, and maybe he does that and he comes out of prison. He does his time, and we flash forward and and he comes out as Jimmy, and Saul Goodman is dead. You know he dies in a metaphorical, in a figurative fashion, and Jimmy's reborn with all this lifted from his conscience therapy. And he comes out, you know, and um, we have a Star Wars moment and uh, the ghosts of, of Howard Hamlin and his brother are, <laughs> are waiting for him outside the prison gates. I don't know. Uh, we'll have to wait and see. But yeah, anyway, so that's my thoughts on today's Better Call Saul. Hopefully you've enjoyed this video. Uh, thanks for watching. We'll be back next week for some more analysis of Better Call Saul and uh, I, know, I think it was, was I, don't, I don't know the next one is it called Fun and Games or something like that but anyway that's next week thanks for watching ta -da.